Bobby, it's Bob and Tony here in Eastern Connecticut. Welcome to the show. Hello, Bobby. Hello. Yeah. Bobby, can you hear us okay? I can hear you, yes. Excellent. Uh, we can't thank you enough for calling, and Bobby, it's a true honor to speak with you. We've had a lot of Yankee legends on this summer, and you're right at the top of that very list, and I hope everything is going well for you. Well, all is well for me. I had a birthday just recently, and I'm 80 years old, but uh, right. health is good, and all is well down this part, South Carolina. And Tony had that in his notes, your 80th birthday Happy last birthday, week. Happy birthday, Bobby. Happy birthday, Bobby. Uh, well, I, thank you. I believe thank I you. was uh, fortunate to speak with you probably five or six years ago on Inside Yankee Baseball with Rich Marazzi, and I know Rich will uh, send yes. his regards as usual, too. So uh, he does send his regards from Southern Connecticut. So, again, uh, for our viewers at home, uh, Bobby, originally from South Carolina, signed by the Yankees as a free agent in 1953, played with the team from 55 to 66, appeared in seven World Series, a seven-time All-Star, won five gold gloves, led the American League in hits and sacrifices in 1962 when he finished second in the MVP voting to his teammate, Mickey Mantle. Again, Bobby played in over 1,400 games in his career uh, with some of the great Yankee uh, legends of yesteryear who we'll talk about as we go on. He was the MVP of the 60 World Series and a losing cause uh, against Pittsburgh. We'll talk more about that. And Bobby had... Uh, Again, I believe 13 or 13 hits, Tony, in the 64 World Series, and that remains a World Series record. And again, we can't thank Bobby enough for taking the time to join us tonight. And uh, we have a bunch of questions, Bobby, and just let us uh, shoot away because there's so much to get to. Uh, you know, Great. when you came up in 1955, Bobby, you were 19 years old, and that might surprise some of our viewers. You're 19 years old. You played 11 games that year under Casey Stengel. I was just wondering, was it an overwhelming experience at the time? Were you nervous uh, finally getting that chance to come to the big city? <laughs> well, I was playing in Denver, which was the Yankees AAA Farm Club, and Hugh McDougall was hit by a line drive, and the Yankees called me up just to fill in for him until he got well again. And after 11 games, he was okay to play, and I was okay to go back to the minor league and to wait uh, until the next year. And uh, the next year I started out with a ball club, but uh, didn't last real long. I lasted uh, through spring training and just for a little while and once again had to go back to the minor leagues. And uh, then I came up finally for the good uh, in 1957. And let me reverse it just for a second, Bobby. Growing up down south, we always like to ask our guests maybe your favorite teams and maybe some of the players that you followed when you were a youngster well my favorite team uh way back in 1950 was the philadelphia phillies and that was the uh because my next door neighbor went up to see the world series of 1950 and the phillies were playing the yankees and he brought me back a phillies yearbook as uh -huh. i thumbed through it and saw Richie Ashburn, Granny Hamner, Robin Roberts, uh, Puddinghead Jones, I thought, wow, that's a good team to root for. Mm -hmm. But that same uh, time, I was a freshman in high school, went out for the high school team, got cut, but I made the American Legion team, and we ended up uh, winning state championship, regional championship, and playing in Charlotte, North Carolina, with the winner of that last game against Richmond, Virginia, going to the American Legion World Series. And I saw the film, Pride of the Yankees. When I saw that film, I thought, what a great organization. I'd be, like to be a part of that. And uh, from that day on, I was a Yankee fan, and I've never looked back. And speaking of the Yankee dynasty, we have Bobby's book. I don't know if the guys can get a shot of it right there. Impact Player. I was thumbing through it right before the, uh, the telecast, Bobby. Some fascinating stuff about those years in Yankee land. And uh, your first uh, your first introduction to the Yankees, here you play six years under Casey Stengel from 55 to 60. The team wins five pennants. You know, we, we've had guys that played for him before, Bobby, and there's a lot of funny stories. He was kind of your cult hero. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion of Casey basically strictly as a baseball manager and his knowledge of the game. 
Well, first of all, I'm not sure he ever learned my name. He would uh, <laughs> call me different things, kid, yeah. rock. He'd call me just different names. But um, I would say that he was unafraid to make moves, but he had two coaches that actually ran the ball. So Frank Crescetti, who had been with him the whole time, was a wonderful coach, and he ran the ball club pretty much. And Jim Turner had the pitching. Stengel's forte was two things. Number one, it was meeting the press. He was interesting. He made a lot of copy. And by the same token, he would uh, make good moves managing because of those two coaches. Occasionally, he would do some things that uh, would be bearish. Uh, he would pinch at a left-handed hitter against a left-hand pitcher, but it would always come through. He had so much talent during those years that everything worked out fine for him. Again, we're fortunate enough to be joined on the phone by former Yankee Bobby Richardson. Tony, questions for Bobby. Bobby, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for coming here. And, thank uh, you, Tony. Uh, well, thank you. And I'm going to ask you a non-baseball question. In reading Impact Player, I thought the story of you meeting Betsy was so sweet. Could you tell us about that? <laughs> Well, Betsy moved to my hometown from a little town about 20 miles away. Her great-grandfather had a lumber mill down in Alcaloo, South Carolina. And in the fourth grade, she moved up to my hometown. And we were in the same church growing up. And I remember watching her grow up. And I used to watch her sit with her mother on the opposite side of the church that I sat in. And finally, as we got of age and as I kept noticing her, I wanted to meet her, and so she wanted to meet me, too, and we walked across the church on the same day, and we were so uh, timid at that time, we just both said hi and walked on by. But her softball coach was a friend of mine. He introduced us. She was a cheerleader at that time, and I remember thinking, what a great-looking girl and what a wonderful Christian, and I'd really like to date her. And we had some dates, and... Uh, uh, ended up getting married and now have been married this year. We work on our 60th year. God bless you. Fantastic. <laughs> That's a great story. Terrific. Great story. And um, as we had mentioned earlier in the show, uh, Bobby was the <clears throat> excuse me MVP of the 1960 World Series. Tony, of course, in a losing cause. Uh, I believe that's the mm -hmm. only time it's ever happened. Uh, I know you're very proud of that. Um, accomplishment Bobby but of course disappointed that the team lost it must have made the 61 and the 62 World Series winning Yankee seasons all the more sweeter well it did that I remember that in particular Mickey Mantle was crying in the clubhouse crying simply because he felt like we had a better ball club we beat them by a lot of runs and they won the close games and then Mazeroski hit the home run that uh, won the series for the Pirates. And he really was crying in the clubhouse. And so 61 and 62, when we were world champions, it uh, made us realize that we did have a good ball club. But in baseball, anything can happen. It happened for Pittsburgh. What a great year that was for the Pirates, and especially for Mazeroski and Burton and some of those ball players that were really great guys as well. And we know what happened, Tony, to Mazeroski, the shot, right? I mean, was, Yeah, um, for certain. It was an amazing uh, a run there. In 61-62, we should say the Yankees had a new manager, Tony T uh, Ralph Houck, of course. Uh, major differences between Stengel and Houck, Bobby? Major differences. They called him major, and they were major. <laughs> Number one, he knew how to handle individuals. Ah. He could uh, bring the most out of an individual, but he molded them together as a team. I remember that when he took over, I'd been in and out of the lineup, back and forth, single would start me, sometimes pinch hit for me once in the first inning even. Boy. And I remember very simply that Ralph said, you're my second baseman now. You'll be in practically every ball game." And I was when he took over. My whole career was with Ralph Howell. He was my manager in Denver. He was my coach in New York. He was my manager in New York, general manager, and came back again as coach that last year. And so um, he had confidence in me. And what a great manager he was. And I had the humbling experience of having his service. Uh, Ralph wasn't going to church a lot at that time, and his son asked and, uh, if I would come down and have the service in Florida. I did go down, and he was just a wonderful man, a great manager. I think everyone we've talked to, Tony, said this similar the same things thing. about Mr. Hauk, and uh, that's great stuff. And as we talk to Bobby, again, we have a collage of – different uh, pictures of him during his career and of course we have a, a current picture 
uh, still picture of him when we speak also. Tony, question? And Bobby, you know, we've all read, you know, Bob and I, we've all watched Mickey Mantle. We've all read about him. We've heard many, many accounts of the man, some good, maybe not, some not so flattering. You knew this man many years as a friend and a brother and a teammate. Who is Mickey Mantle to you? Well, Mickey Mantle, when I was 17 years old and came to New York, fielded some ground balls, stood around the batting gate, came up behind me and said, come on, kid, step in here and take some swings. And it really started a friendship that lasted a lifetime. When I came back up as a 19-year-old, he was the first one to congratulate me. He said, hey, come over here. This is the opening day of the season. I'm going to make like I'm showing you around Yankee Stadium. There'll be a photographer here, and you'll be in the newspaper with a picture tomorrow. And that happened just that way. And then as a teammate for a dozen years, quiet leadership, could outrun anybody in the game of baseball. And he was a quiet leader. Not many people realize how much influence he had on the ball club. He liked to play tricks. His young ball players came up the first time he'd get together the, the players that would be starting that day. And, and the young rookie would be the first time out. And we'd run out about 20 yards, something like that. And then we'd all stop and come back in. And the rookie would be the one that would be out there by himself wondering what to do. Should I go back? Should I keep on going? And, he was fun-loving, but at the same time, he did more than his part to win the game, but was really a leader in baseball. And I should say, we I, I, last count, Tony, I was just looking at our lists of uh, teammates of Bobby's that have been on the show, and I believe there's four of them, uh, Eli Gerba, Al Downing, Jim Bowden, and Fritz Peterson. So mm -hmm. that's... Um, a pretty good list, uh, and uh, we're trying to go chronologically here, Bobby. It's such it's such a great career you've had. You know, 1962, and you've been asked this question so many times. Uh, 62, that final out of the World Series, Tony Willie McCovey hits this line drive. If it's a hit, Giants go on to win it all. Right. Bobby actually snags the line drive, and uh, the Yankees again our world champions. Now, again, Bobby, I think we asked you this a few years back. Your thoughts as soon as the ball came off the bat, did you have time to react, or was that an all-reflex type of thing? And, and not to... It, it was... Oh, no, please go was, ahead. Excuse me. It was mostly instinct. Yeah. I do remember that before the pitch, Ralph Hout walked out, talked to Ralph Terry, and I walked over to my teammate and roommate for so many years, Tony Kubek, and Willie Mays was standing on second base, and Kubek said to me, I sure hope you doesn't you don't blow the ball if McCovey hits it to you. And I said, why? He said, well, you've already made one error in this series. So we'd hate to see you blow it now. And that's what I was thinking about when I got back <laughs> to my position. Ralph Terry actually looked around and thought I was playing out of position. I think I was playing him in the hole a little bit more than he thought I should be. Started to say something, walked a step or two toward me, but then turned around and said, no, he's played a lot of games there. Uh, maybe he knows more than I do. And then, of course, he hit the ball and I caught it. And right before I got down and got set, the umpire at second base said, Hey, Rich, can I have your cap for my little cousin? It was a National League umpire, and as soon as I caught the ball, I turned around, flipped my cap to the umpire, and then uh, uh, ran into the mound, gave the ball to Ralph Terry. I did, uh, didn't see Willie McCovey or hear from him for 45 years, but when I saw him the next time in San Francisco at a banquet, we were both throwing out the first ball at the new stadium, he said to me, I bet your hand is still hurting. And I said, you hit, you hit it hard. And he said it was one of the hardest balls he'd ever hit. Just didn't get it up in the air. It had overspring, Matt overspin. Mantle used to hit balls like that occasionally. Hit on top of the ball. That start up, looked like a base hit, came down in a hurry. It's uh, it surely is a game of inches, Bobby. It and really that, is. That didn't prove it anything. And again, he mentioned Tony Kubek, Tony, and what an infield, uh, Kubek mm -hmm. and Cleet Boyer and Bobby with the gold gloves. Uh, one of the greatest fielding infields ever. Uh, go ahead, Tony. Oh, thanks. Well, Bobby. you you got that right. Cleet Boyer was actually the best defensive third base in all of baseball, and I think Brooks Robinson would be the first to tell you that. Mm -hmm. Brooks was such a good all-around player that he couldn't even win a gold glove in the American League. But as soon as he moved over to the National League, he picked up that gold glove and instead of hitting eighth on the lineup, he was hitting in the power spots. He was a great ball player, and I miss him very much. Tony Kubek was an outstanding roommate, but an outstanding baseball player. Very smart. 
He knew everything about baseball, and that was evident when he went into broadcast and after his playing days. And I think uh, did a great job and was awarded by being in the Hall of Fame as an announcer. And, uh, Bobby, thank you. You did answer the question about the cap. I'm going to bring you back a year to 1961. And Bob and I have seen the Billy Crystal movie, 61, about the home run chase. And in that movie, the Roger Maris character is really, I don't want to say he's writing Mickey Mantle, but he's very closely watching him. Was that the way it went on, actually, or did they have a different kind of relationship? You know, I... I think if I were completely honest, I would say that they had a great relationship. They actually lived together, doing some days together. And I think that uh, Mickey was pulling for Roger to break that title and to break Babe Ruth's home run record when it was uh, assured that he couldn't play those last days. And I think it was just a matter of Mickey knew how to take the pressure. Roger didn't. And so all of those questions on that last season, are you now going to break Babe Ruth's home run record? Just were about to drive him nuts. He was losing his hair, and he said the only piece he had was actually on the playing field. But Mickey and Roger had a good relationship, and uh, Mickey was glad to see him because, believe it or not, they used to boo Mickey at Yankee Stadium until Roger came on board, and <laughs> then those boos just switched over to Roger, and he appreciated him being there. And, uh, and again, for our audience, we're on the phone with uh, former Yankee, Bobby Richardson, uh, who's been kind enough to call in. We're having a great time. Uh, Tony and I were talking right before we went on the air, Bobby, about the 63 World Series. Maybe not so great of memories for any Yankee, but uh, that <laughs> game one, uh, Tony and I have always been just totally blown away by, the, by, by Sandy Koufax and the talent and the, and the numbers he put up. And, of course, he, you never struck out much at all. I told Tony you... I was doing the research. I believe you struck out 28 times per every 162 games you played, which is beyond phenomenal. And Koufax gets you three times in game one. That's the only time I think you've ever struck out three times in a game. That day, Bobby, if you remember, was Sandy, was he mixing up his pitches? I want you to tell the audience how dominant this guy was, how what impossible like was. Him? Yeah, it's just amazing. <laughs> Well, he really was dominant, and Kubek was leading off, of course, and he struck out, I struck out, and then Mantle, first time up, struck out, and second time around, Kubek struck out, I struck out again, and Mantle did too, and the third time up, I just wanted to be a first ball hitter, hit the ball somewhere, somehow, but I didn't after Kubek struck out the third time, I struck out the third time, and what? when I was walking back to the dugout, Mantle was walking up, and he said, no use for me to go up there, and he got him <laughs> three times too. He had wonderful... Um, first of all, control, his fastball would take off, his straight changeup looked like a fastball, the curve looked like it was dropping off of a dime with 10-point control. Now, if you'll notice and read, he pitched the fourth game as well. Different background, different stadium, and it was a different ball game. He didn't strike out as many, but he was a dominant pitcher, and he won that fourth game. I think if you check, I probably got a couple of hits off him in that, mm -hmm. in that uh, fourth game that he pitched. But uh, he wrote a book, and in that book he said when he struck out the second time, he knew he had real good stuff that day, and he sure did. And I had mentioned the 28 strikeouts per every 162 games. It's a, holy, it's a totally different game they play now, Bobby. It's more big bucks, um, big home runs, things like that. Uh, was your secret to putting the bat on the ball, was this something you were taught at a very early age, was there someone you can credit for that? Is, is, or is it, was it just something you had a penchant for doing? Well, you know, I, I think I realized that I was not a power hitter. Mm -hmm. The most home runs I hit was in 62. I had eight home runs that year. And I was not a power hitter, nor was the stadium uh, a good ballpark that hit the home run. And for me, well over 400 feet in the left center, right center, and center field at Yankee Stadium. And so I felt like it was my job just to get on base. And um, everybody said, well, you don't get any walks. Well, I didn't swing and miss very much. That's true. But at the same time, um, you won't get many walks when you look at the guys coming up behind you. And it starts out with Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, Moose Karen, Yogi Berra, Elston Howard. So they didn't want to put me on base. I had to earn my way on so no walks would come my way. 
And uh, I just uh, played at the right time with a great, great group of players that had an awful lot of talent. I think the 61-62 teams were the best during that time, and arguably that 61 team would be comparable to some of the great teams in baseball that are, that are honored in that way. Bobby, you know, as far as I'm going to take you back one more year to 1960, and you are the World Series MVP, and I understand they gave you a Corvette. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> I have to laugh when you say that because uh, they did. It was a 1960 Corvette. They had it in New York when we got back from Pittsburgh. And let me say, first of all, how surprised I was. Mantle was crying. <laughs> But when they walked in the clubhouse to tell us and to tell the team that I had been uh, voted the most valuable player in the series, I was shocked because I'd never heard of a losing team having an MVP, and I don't think you'll ever have that again. What is ironic is that Sport Magazine uh, had a president who also wrote a novel and who also was the one to make that decision on who receives the most valuable player award. And in that novel, when I was just 13 years old in South Carolina, he wrote a novel about a Yankee shortstop. And it just happened at that time that the name in the book of his novel, and his name was Ed Fitzgerald, uh, was Bobby Richardson. Now, I don't know whether that entered into it. I do know that I've heard that they made the decision before Mazeroski hit the home run. And um, so I was surprised. But when I drove my Corvette back to South Carolina... I couldn't get my two boys. I had two boys, and my wife was expecting what turned out to be a girl. Couldn't get them in the Corvette, so I took my Corvette down to the Pontiac place, traded my old Pontiac and the Corvette in for a new Pontiac station wagon ah. and a Jeep. Not a big Jeep, <laughs> but a small CJ5, CJ7 Jeep. I like to hunt them an outdoorsman. It worked out so good for me. I actually drove it into the stadium a good number of times. Uh, as I look back and my son would say, Dad, I can't believe you did that. I can't either at this time. But then it was a good decision for me. Yep, but it fit all the kids and it fit all the family. That's <laughs> yes, all that made a right. difference. Yes. And I should say in that 60 World Series, uh, Bobby had 11 hits, 12 RBIs, Tony. Uh, six yeah. of them came in Game 3 uh, of that 60 World Series. Again, in his World Series career, he played 36 games, 40 hits, which came out to a 305 average and uh you know the five gold gloves you won bobby we talked to west parker a couple weeks ago i think he won six in a row uh the former dodger and he always he told us it was to him he had a brother that just kept hitting him ground balls it was all about repetition he said there was no secret about being a good fielding first baseman I wanted to ask you the same question i mean it some guys are known as hitting second baseman, some guys can field. Uh, for you, was there any secrets on how you became a great fielder? I think it would go back to my time growing up and loving baseball so much and throwing the tennis ball against the steps at my home, mm -hmm. uh, throwing it against the wall, brick wall, and then having a mentor that used to hit me 100 ground balls at a time and said, if you miss one, we start all over again. Boy. And I think I developed a... Uh, I, I think I knew that I could feel ground balls, and I had a confidence in doing that. But I just, uh, you know, when you're playing at Yankee Stadium and there's so many people in the stands, it's an exciting time, especially in World Series time. And every year that I played except one out of the first ten, nine of those years, we were in the World Series. And so my my no no playoffs at that time, just the winner of the American League plays the winner of the National League. And, mm -hmm. If you look back in 55 and 6, they voted me a third share and a fifth share. And then from 57 through 64, uh, seven more. So that's nine out of 10 years we were in the series. So, wow, was that fun to play at that time. It sure was. Now, Yogi could say, I'll duplicate that and add 10 more. But uh, he was there at, uh, at the, uh, completely. I, I felt like that I, I wanted to get out and spend more time with my family. So at 29... Tony Kubek and I, rooming together, both agreed that we had won nine out of ten years and it was time to make our family a priority. And we were both going to retire. And believe it or not, Sports Illustrated got wind of it. They sent a photographer over, took the picture of Tony and I, 
and we were going to be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. In fact, Tony has that picture, sent me a copy just the other day. And um, then what happened? Ralph Howe took over as general manager of the ball club, and he said, hey, uh, Tony, I want one of you two guys, I don't care which one, to play one more year and break Bobby Mercer in. And it was all set up that Tony would play another year and I would retire. And as it turned out, Tony was called into the reserve program and playing touch football, got a pinched nerve, and Mayo Clinic said he had to retire. Mm -hmm. It might result in a paralysis. And so Ralph Howe called me and said, Tony can't play. Will you play one more year? And I said, I'd be glad to do that. And he gave me a five-year contract, one to play and four just to decide what I wanted to do. And as it turned out, Bobby Mercer was drafted. And so he was not there until the last two weeks of the season. And uh, so that was the reason. Now, I'm sad to say that right now Tony's going through a little battle with his health. Mm -hmm. That initial that initial in injury has made it so right now he's going through a little bit of a paralysis. I think the outlook is good. He's going to be fine. But right now he just can't hardly hold a baseball in his hand. Mm -hmm. But the doctors mm -hmm. say it's a good outlook and it'll be back to normal before too long. But that injury um, is what started it all. It's um, still there. No, we're, we're here. <laughs> and uh, Bobby, I just want to ask you a little bit about 1964. And Yogi becomes your manager. And uh, I was old enough then to read the New York papers. And the writers were reporting that Bear has lost this club. Bear has not gotten control of this team. And then there was the harmonica incident. Then it really looked like, at least to a little kid reading the paper, that Bear had lost the club. Um, what what was it like playing under Yogi, and was it an adjustment for him and you guys because he was your teammate? Let me just start out by saying that Betsy and I were in Fort Lauderdale in spring training, and Yogi came by our house, and he said, I want to try something out on you. Tomorrow, for the first time, I'll be speaking to the Yankee Ball Club as their manager. Been a teammate all these years, and now I'm the manager, and I'm going to set some rules. No tennis, no swimming, no golf, no card playing. And then he said, no, I'm just kidding. We'll work hard on the field, but we'll have fun. Now, it didn't go very well. In a funny way, after three rules, Mantle jumped up and threw his bat down, said, I quit, started to walk out. <laughs> Everybody laughed. But he never lost control. He knew when to take the pitchers out. He made smart moves. It was just one of those seasons where you couldn't really get it together. It's sort of like this year with the Yankees mm -hmm. a little bit, I think, and uh, – and then finally they had that harmonica incident, and I think rather than losing control, that brought us back together for the final time of the season. And we, of course, ended on the next to the last day of the season uh, winning the pennant. In fact, I asked Yogi, too, that was out. He had an injury and wasn't able to play in the series. And I said, Yogi, can I play shortstop on this last day? And he said, what do you want to play shortstop for? And I said, originally I came up as a shortstop, and I've had a few games at shortstop. And I'd just like to have one more game at shortstop. He said, okay, don't get hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I played shortstop. But I was the more surprised person in the world when flying back from New York on the plane, he sat down, my wife and I, and he said, I'm meet with the Yankees tomorrow. I'm going to ask for a two-year contract. And then I'm sure he was the most surprised person when the next day I was listening on the radio and it said Yogi Bear has been replaced by Johnny Keene. Mm -hmm. Never did understand that. I don't think they made that decision the day after the season, but I think it was made early in the year when perhaps they thought he lost control. But he hadn't lost control. He was a great manager, and, of course, after years came back again. And uh, just a wonderful guy, and 90 years of age now, and he's the one that everybody wants to see, and I'm sorry he couldn't come to Old Timers game this year. Just a tremendous individual, lost his wife and battling now uh, in assisted living, but just, uh, and I, I don't think he lost control. He was the best hitter in baseball, too. Best bad ball hitter, anyway. <laughs> sure. We've heard that from many people. Again, we just have a couple more minutes with Bobby Richardson, and again, we had mentioned uh, throughout the show how close you were with Mantle, Bobby. You ended up officiating at his funeral uh, I always like to ask some of our guests, some of your other teammates that you've remained very good friends with over the years. Well, Mandel and I had a place together in Boone, North Carolina. Most people are surprised when they hear that. 
but we had a wonderful townhouse at Grandfather Mountain in Boone, North Carolina. And we were up there together on numerous occasions. We were grand marshal of the ski festival up there. We spent time together. We actually read the scriptures together, prayed together. And then on four occasions, came to my home in Sumter, South Carolina. I gave away 2,000 Mickey Mantle bats. He gave a batting exhibition. He wouldn't do that for anybody. I put together a highlight film on his days, and he saw it and said, it's the best film I've ever seen. I want that. And then uh, he had asked me at Roger Maris's funeral if I would have his funeral. He was not going to church at the time, and I did uh, make all the arrangements for the place for the funeral and for Bob Costas to come in and be a part of it. The hymns picked out everything. But we had a close relationship. And not only that, but in those last days, he really came through for the Lord. And the one person that he really impacted Mickey's life was Pete Maravich basketball player, lifestyle very much like Mickey's, but he had one of the most humble testimonies I think I ever heard concerning his relationship with the Lord, and that had the impact in his life, and I was able to share that on national television when I had that humbling experience of having his service. Wow. Kubek and I are close as well, very close friends. Very interesting, because Tony knows, Pete Maravich is probably my idol growing up, because uh, as far as fascinating individuals in their respective sports, we can talk about Mantle and Maravich and Usain Bolt, if you want to go to track and field. Uh, mm -hmm. Maravich uh, is, was on another stratosphere, but that's for another yeah. show, Bobby. And um, well, last question for me before I give you over to Tony. I mean, you were the head baseball coach at South Carolina from 70 to 76. You went to the College World Series, three NCAA tournament appearances, incredible record, 221 rank, wins, Bobby. Uh, you really put that school on the baseball map, and you later coached at Liberty, Coastal Carolina. I was just wondering if you any, had ever had any thoughts or opportunities to manage at any higher levels. Well, I have. In fact, when I called the Yankees after three years, they had asked me to be the boss baseball coach at South Carolina. Turned them down the first two times. But the third time, I said, I think I'm ready now. But I have a five-year contract with the Yankees. Let me call and get a release. And when I did, talking to Lee McPhail, he said, now, wait a minute. He said, if you want to, you can come back and see our major, be our major league coach. You can be our broadcaster, or you can be our triple-A manager. And I said, no, the Lee, the reason I got out was the travel involved, the separation from family. And then he made the statement, when you get settled, just give us a call. We'll bring the Yankees down to play your ball club. Hmm. And we lost by one run to Miami in regional play, and I called him, and he said, well, we got a little problem. We're traveling north from spring training with the Mets. Would it be all right if the Mets and the Yankees come play your ball club? Yogi was managing the Mets. We played three against the Yankees, three against the Mets. They played each other under the lights, just put our team on the map. And right after that, we did finish second in the nation. Our record was 51 and six. I had a little advantage. Whitey Ford's son was my switch hitting shortstop, number one draft choice to the Red Sox. Um, uh, Scooter Rizzuto's son played for me down there. Al Worthington's son was my second baseman. I called Yogi. I said, you go send your son down. He said, no, he's going right to the big leagues. And he did. Played for his dad in the big leagues. Moose Cowan's son was a great player. Told me later that he wished he had played for me, and I too wished that too. And believe it or not, I had Wade Boggs and Tino Martinez. Tino Martinez signed up to play. They both signed professionally. And I saw Wade the other day in New York at an old Travis game, and I said, do you think you made the right decision not playing for me? And he said, well, let me think now. Uh, I'm making $14 million. Yes, I think I did. He did. <laughs> he did. And he did okay for himself, Bobby. He did you better well. believe it. Yes. Last question, Tony, for Bobby. Bobby, we've been honored, and we've been so blessed to have you. And I'm curious, the wonderful career you've had, the family God has blessed you with, the wonderful woman you married, the inspiration you've been to others. Any regrets you've had along the way? Well, you know, I don't think I would change anything. I have four new great grandchildren that are under 10 months of age now, 15 grandchildren. My family is all excited about the Lord, each one doing a wonderful thing, not only in the business world, but uh, with the Lord as well. And so I just feel like the Lord has placed me in baseball. And when I wrote the book, Joe Girardi wrote the uh, forward in the book, it. and boy, he hit it on the head. I had uh, a wonderful time in baseball, and only two thoughts, that I hope I played in a way that made, made my team a little better, and secondly, that I had an impact on those that I was associated with on and off the field. 
And the Lord has really blessed all my associations in baseball. So many have gone on to be with the Lord now. And so that time in life, when I'm 80 years old, and family had a surprise birthday party for me, and it was sort of like a memorial, 200 people there. And, and it's sort of like you're there yourself, but it's not a funeral service, just a memorial service. <laughs> great, great talking with you guys. Thanks for the call. And well, thanks for the memories. Again, I just enjoyed so much playing in New York for the Yankees. We can't thank you enough. And again, hence the, the name of the book, Impact Player, on the table right here. And uh, Bobby, we wish you and your family continued good luck and health. And God bless the entire family. And uh, please keep us posted. And, and uh, thank you so much again for calling in tonight. Well, you're welcome. Good to talk to you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Bobby. See you good later. Night. Good night. Take care now.